first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Graham and I'm Team Medical for inviting me to this meeting. It's a privilege to be the first speaker. I also had, uh, I'm very sorry to, to change the title. <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about challenges in neonatal ventilation, but I'm not a neonatologist. I see a few neonatologists, so I'm really worried now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I thought that I'll talk about a niche area that uh, covers both pediatrics and uh, neonatal. And uh, so this is an area that uh, has uh, puzzled me for several years. So I thought that I'll talk about uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Um, just a word about our chairman. I just found out that we have in common uh, a teacher, Pat, you, you came up a, a little bit late. We both uh, have a common uh, teacher, Max Klein, uh, whom I just uh, learned passed away. When is it? That was it? Yeah, I haven't heard from him for a while, so I'm very sorry to hear that. But he was a very, very good teacher. And I think uh, I also sent a few of my medical students to Cape Town to do their elective uh, with him. And they were very pleased with the experience in Cape Town. Right, so, so, back to the topic. So, I thought that I'll talk about the diaphragmatic hernia. So, um, so I think uh, for those neonatologists in the audience, they would be very familiar with this. Uh, left usually the diaphragmatic hernia. It's, uh, it's a, it is a congenital one. Usually left-sided, but of course could be right-sided as well. And uh, what happens is that the intestines, the small intestines, they uh, stay up in the chest, and uh, as a result of this uh, mass in the left chest, um, the, the, the left lung is compressed, the heart is <coughs> displaced, the liver also herniates up, and uh, quite often the spleen, the left kidney is also up. Everything is up except the right kidney. Um, so the survival rates for the, the incidence is about 1 in 3,000, possibly it could be even more than 1 in 3,000 uh, 3, uh, 3, because quite a number do not make it to, to the ICU. Um, the survival rates over the past 30 years have uh, changed. As you can see that um, it started off with 40% and then 60-70%. And it hasn't really got uh, much better than that, uh, uh, even uh, with the best of technology. And uh, one of the major differences was that, uh, that contributed to an improvement is that uh, the surgical repair is delayed. It used to be that if the baby was uh, with a uh, diaphragmatic hernia was born in a car park, the surgery would be done in the car park. But now, you know, people uh, take a little bit of time to stabilize the baby or they could send the baby for surgery. So the, over the years, we have also seen an, a rise, and I don't think it's an increase in incidence, it's just that uh, people become more aware that of our interest, so they start uh, sending cases to us. And uh, so the inherent problems, usually these babies have very good birth weight. There may be other congenital abnormalities, usually cardiac, and if they are syndromic babies, usually they have very poor prognosis. So essentially, the, the, uh, both lungs are hypoplastic. Uh, the, the ipsilateral lung is more <coughs> affected. And because the lungs are hypoplastic, the pulmonary vessels are also hypoplastic. And this gives rise to uh, increased vascular resistance and a persistence of the pulmonary hypertension that we see in the fetal stage. So this uh, following delivery, the uh, intestines uh, become filled with air, <coughs> so it becomes a, a space occupying region, compresses the ipsilateral lung, causing a more severe shift in the mediastinum and uh, compression of both the ipsilateral and the uh, contralateral lungs. So this uh, poses a, a great challenge uh, to the physicians. So here we have a uh, lung hypoplasia, a child with very severe respiratory distress, who is inherently as uh, both lungs are hypoplastic. 
There's also in addition mechanical compression from the organs that have herniated up, and there is a pulmonary hypertension, and uh, the baby essentially is hypoxic, hypocarbic with a metabolic acidosis. So now the recent advances in the perioperative management of CDH is that um, the, the primary defect uh, is not in the diaphragm, but in the lungs being hypoplastic. So the deficiency in the diaphragm is a secondary phenomenon. So therefore, it makes sense that uh, we should, uh, there's no need to rush in to do the surgery, but it's important to stabilize the baby until he's more stable to get to surgery. So we use, uh, over the years, uh, we have learned uh, from also our mistakes and uh, from others that we have to use a lung protective strategy and we limit our pressures and because these lungs are hypoplastic and uh, we also try to prevent uh, the hyperoxic injuries to the lungs by just adjusting the uh, FiO2, use the minimal FiO2 to, uh, and we adjust it to the preductal. Uh, saturation and we keep the saturation about 80, 85 to 90 percent. Anything above uh, 90 percent is extravagant. We also uh, practice permissive hypercapnia, but there is a limit to it because of the pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension, which is uh, very sensitive to hypercapnia. Uh, patients with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension uh, may benefit from inhaled nitric oxide since uh, the advent of uh, inhaled nitric oxide, it has really made a, a difference to how our patients uh, behave. And of course, uh, there is the extracorporeal uh, uh, membrane oxygenator, which we don't have in, uh, in our ICU. So that has also been uh, used. So now, to, to just to illustrate the difficulties of uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, as a result of the of the pressure, the lungs being hypoplastic, so the pressure is in the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery remains high, as in the fetal stage, and therefore, and because the lungs are hypoplastic, there's very little venous return, or pulmonary venous return, so the left side of the heart is basically quite, hypo, quite underdeveloped, the right side is quite big, and the pressures on the pulmonary side is very high, and because uh, it remains high and the PDA is patent, this PDA is usually very large and on the echo it looks like it, is the, it forms the, the duct, so sometimes we call it uh, the, 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 the ductal arch, uh, so there is a left right shunt uh, into the descending, uh, into the arch of the ureter and down the descending. So the patent ductus arteriosus causes a, a, a right to, to left shunt across the PDA causes a differential cyanosis. Um, so we have a preductal uh, upper limb that are well saturated and uh, a postductal lower limbs uh, which are desaturated. And uh, if the saturation in the lower limbs are less than 10% of the upper limb, the preductal sets, then we we need to recognize that there is a pulmonary hypertension uh, in place and manage that accordingly. So the preductal SpO2 and the PaO2 are more indicative of the alveolar ventilation. So when we adjust our ventilation, it is to the preductal gases. So usually we put a line in the, uh, in the radial artery and uh, and follow the, the gases. Uh, use the gases, uh, the blood gases in the pump, uh, in the right radio to guide our ventilation. So the, the first uh, strategy about managing uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia is to be really mindful. Mindful of the possible harm that we can do when we resuscitate these desperately ill children. So first of all, the first problem that can occur even at the time of the, the resuscitation is the intubation itself. So I see sometimes people are so excited, they push the tube down very, very far in and then they go into the right main bronchus and then they ventilate them the only lung that is actually functioning and then break it up. Right? So, so now we, we, we this is, uh, can, uh, the, so the pneumothorax could be due to a right main bronchus intubation 
or just in, inappropriate ventilation strategies using high pressures and IO2 to, for the one and only good lung. So the consequences are barotrauma, ventilator induced lung injury, chronic lung disease, if you survive the acute episode and, uh, and death. And if you stay too long and of course you get the sepsis. So once you get it into uh, pneumothorax, it's really quite difficult to, to reverse the, the situation. So the best uh, strategy is to be mindful of uh, every step along the way that we do not uh, introduce a barotron. So the second uh, strategy is to optimize the lung volume. Obviously, both the lungs are squashed. So we have to optimize the lung volume. And once the lung volume is optimized, Pulmonary vascular resistance decreases somewhat, and we achieve some form of uh, hemodynamic stability. And during this time, we also need to optimize the parental nutrition for the baby. So nowadays, uh, we uh, have mothers who are diagnosed antenatally. We do some counseling. So we decide on the place of delivery, the mode of delivery, and they, they get to meet the team, the parents, get to meet the ICU team and the surgical team. So there's some mental preparation on that. And uh, usually, the, nowadays, again, all these channels took several years to uh, pave it, but it's now kind, kind of well established that before the delivery, we are informed that mother is in labor, and we will prepare for the baby to come the, uh, admission. So we would set, get our ventilators, pre-set our ventilators, set up the nitric oxide delivery system, have two pulse oximeters, one in the pre-ductal, one in the post-ductal and get our inotropes and sedation and uh, all the uh, necessary drugs uh, ready for the baby. So post-delivery intubation, we always tell our doctors who attend to the delivery that they have to do a good clearance, not to intubate immediately, but to good spend about you know, half a, uh, 10 seconds or so clearing out the airway and then to do a very careful intubation and I use the term stop at night. 9 is 9 centimeters at the lip. Alright, so don't go beyond that. And of course, you should do a back mask uh, ventilation. And then an oral gastric tube is inserted and then they are transferred to the PQ with a ventilator. And during this transfer, to avoid a rigorous uh, ventilation. So once they are in the PQ, we do an ABC check. Uh, check again, always be mindful whether the pneumothorax has, has uh, occurred and uh, connect the patient to our preset uh, ventilator and keep checking on the ABCs. So the pre and post ductal set of pulse oximeters are in place. The pre ductal sets will set represent the oxygenation by the lungs. The post ductal represents if there's any difference, there's chunk across the PDA. So therefore, a right radial artery is uh, usually inserted very uh, early on. So we start then to decompress bowels because invariably some gas would have already reached the bowels and inflate and then push the heart some of them get a chest x-ray. So be very careful with the fluids if the baby is hypotensive and needs fluid resuscitation, be very careful with this because there is a pulmonary hypertension. So if there if we push the fluids in, we uh, increase the volume of the right ventricle because the fluid does not necessarily cross from the venous side to the systemic side, so it gets jammed up in the right ventricle, balloons up the right ventricle, and there is an interdependence of the right and the left at this point, and therefore that may even uh, compromise uh, the systemic circulation. So if there's any fluid resuscitation that needs to be done, it has to be done over slowly. Okay? We use small boluses over gradually over three to four hours and uh, use our inotropes to maintain a, a decent uh, systemic arterial pressure. So we usually we try not to stabilize, uh, these disturb the child too much because the, the pulmonary hypertension is in place, is there. Whether it is manifest itself, we don't know, but it is certainly it is there. All right, because the lungs are hypoplastic. So try not to, so we do not to put in central lines or anything, just use our umbilical excess to put in all our Months. Now, um, to achieve a uh, gas exchange, uh, we use um, a very gentle ventilation strategy. So, first of all, we use the minimum oxygen. So, if you tailor your FiO2 to the pre ductal sense, 
you'll find that actually you can use uh, quite low uh, oxygen settings. So the pre-ductal uh, oxygen saturation that we target is 85%. Right? You use the lowest FiO2 and you adjust it very, cut, cut down on it very slowly because the pulmonary uh, uh, vessels at this point is very, very sensitive to oxygen. Oxygen is a very potent vasodilator and if you change the FiO2 suddenly too, too fast, it may trigger off a pulmonary vasoconstriction. So if you adjust it, it will be like 1%, 2% every half an hour. So it's that gentle. Right? We also allow a little bit of hypercapnia, but uh, as long as the pH is compensated, we, we, we don't uh, apply, try and uh, hyperventilate these babies uh, too much. Uh, unlike in the early days before we had this, we used to hyperventilate them to get a, a pH that is a little bit alkalotic, because the alkalotic pH is also a very good uh, uh, pulmonary vasodilator. Now, so the modes of ventilation that we use are conventional ventilation, uh, high frequency positive pressure ventilation, and high frequency oscillation. So the first mode is uh, uh, conventional and we keep the peak 1 to 5, rates uh, about 40 to 80 and the PIP definitely less than 25 uh, centimeters of water. And the baby fails this and when we say failure, it means we fail to achieve an SpO2, a preductal SpO2 of 85%. <coughs> With an FiO2 of, uh, we need a higher FiO2 of more than 60% and we are using 70-80% to just to achieve a preductal saturation of 85%. We move on to a high frequency positive pressure ventilation. This was uh, first described by Boom in 1995 and he used a rate of about 100. And in this uh, strategy, the, the PEP, the, P, uh, the end expiratory pressure is either 0 or 1. And we go at 100, that means the I time is about 0 0.3 seconds and the PIP is about 20 to 25 centimeters of water. And if the baby stabilizes on that, we stay there and then we can cut back as we as the baby stabilizes. If not, within a couple of hours, within usually within one to two hours, we would know whether the baby can take this strategy. If not, then we will mount the oscillator. And when we use, we use a sensomatic oscillator, we keep the frequency usually of 15 because 15 hertz is has a more gentle uh, is more lung protective than a uh, lower frequency. Um, CO2 removal, um, we try not to do hyperventilation, not to keep the pH to uh, CO2 too low, so we just get an adequate chest rise. Okay? So it's very much a clinical uh, decision. So the delta P, the pressure, the inflating pressure is about 10 to 14 <coughs> centimeters of water. So with that, uh, PIP is uh, usually kept at less than 20. So you can see the pressures are very low. Uh, we avoid the hypocarbia or alkalosis. Um, we, once we, we, we hit a, a hypocarbia or alkalosis or respiratory alkalosis, then we start reducing the inflation pressure. And uh, if the patient is hypercarbic, it is not to, the first thing is not to just increase the ventilation, but to, to listen and see maybe there are some secretions that we can remove from the tracheal. Uh, from the airway. And uh, when we do this, we used to have an open suction technique, but now we have a closed suction technique. So we can uh, measure our distance so that we do not in cause injury to the carina. Now, ox for oxygenation, we use a preductal saturation, and, uh, and if, if we can't get an arterial line, then a, cap uh, a capillary blood is good enough. Okay, so it is uh, not always that we have the ideal situation. So sometimes we just have to make do with uh, minimum settings, and minimally invasive, so that we do not disturb these babies um, with uh, pulmonary hypertension. So the lowest FiO2 and then reduce it very gradually. Like I said before, if they are saturating well, we reduce by 1% every half an hour. So the nurses will be there at the bedside you will do that uh, gradual reduction. And it's amazing if you sit at the bedside and you just move the dial uh, down slowly, you know, within 24 hours you can reduce the FiO2 by 10, 20%. So if the FiO2 is still more than 60% to achieve a PaO2 of 50, 60, 
then uh, we switch to a high frequency positive pressure ventilation. If not, then it will be a high frequency oscillator. <coughs> and you then always be mindful that if there's no improvement, to see if there is a hemothorax. So this ventilation was, like I mentioned before, first described by Wong, and we find it actually quite useful. It's quite uh, when we first heard about it, you know, ventilating at 100 with an eye time of 0 0.3 seconds with a peak of zero. How on earth are we going to ventilate these patients? But it actually works quite well for some babies. Right? So the, the delta key at this point is about 10 to 16, and babies, if they respond, they pick up very quickly. So we can then reduce the airway. So basically, in this uh, ventilation strategy, it, uh, the mean, you have to watch, keep an eye on the mean airway pressure, even though the PEP is zero, actually there is an open peak because the eye time and the, the, the inspiratory time and the expiratory time is very short, so there is a stacking of the brain. So basically, it's the auto peak that is doing the lung protein. So it is, so we, there, there is a monitor there at the side there that tells you, even though our peak at the machine is zero, at the airway, it is about four centimeters of water. So that is the auto peak that is doing the lung recruitment for us. And as usual, we will compare the pre and post ductal saturation and if there is a difference, if the post ductal is lower by 10%, then we would uh, trickle in the nitric oxide at this point. Mm. So again, we try and get the FiO2 down to 50%, less than 50%, and uh, we know that we get there. Because we find that the baby that suddenly, you know, instead of huffing and puffing away, it stops breathing. It's just like relaxes, let the ventilator take over. And when you see that, you know that you're clearing the CO2, you're stabilizing the pH. And uh, so we have the option of either reducing the PIP or reducing the rate. So if we are on a very high PIP, then of course we would want to minimize the, 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 the barrel trauma. So we reduce the peak inspiratory pressure. If, but if the PIP is already very low, then we reduce the rate. So we know that by this time we have already achieved quite good lung volumes. And we, again, when we reduce the rate in a similar way as we reduce the FiO2, we reduce the rate by two to three breaths each time. Okay? So every half an hour we we'll get down to two, reduce it by two breaths, shape of two breaths, two breaths, two breaths. Two breath. right? So once we reduce the rate, now with this uh, high frequency uh, positive pressure ventilation, when you reduce the rate, you've got to get the PEP up. So you have to dial up the PIP. So normally a PEP, all right. So to, so that the auto peak is still around about four. So, so we haven't changed very much of the auto peak until we get down to 60, 60 breaths per minute, and that is a time when the the, the anesthetist will say, that, yeah, yeah, we can go for surgery. Otherwise, the anesthetist is not a going to allow the child to get to the theater. So, uh, optimal lung volumes and pulmonary vasculature just to remind us uh, of where we want to be. So we would want to, so initially the lungs are down here and then with the PEP, our ventilation strategies, uh, we are moving slowly, recruiting the lungs up to here. All right? Try not to get the patients up to here. All right? So this is something that you need to avoid and so it is, when the babies are well, they are Usually our babies are not uh, muscle relaxed, so we know that if they stop breathing, their CO2 is actually quite low. So we try to then, at this point when they stop breathing, we start to get down our, either the rate or the uh, PIP, so that we keep the lung in this uh, part of the pressure volume curve. And uh, an optimal lung volume will also have the minimum pulmonary vascular resistance. As you can see here, the pulmonary vascular resistance, when the lung volume is low, the resistance is high, and uh, as we recruit the lung, the pulmonary vascular resistance drops, and if we over then at this level, and in this uh, part of the curve, the PBR increases. So, so that is actually a lot more difficult to manage a hyperinflated lung. So we try not to get to that situation. So in the first 24 hours, I always tell the parents, the dice is cast in the first 24 hours. It is, if the patient baby stabilizes within 24 hours, we know he's on the right track, we know that uh, he's going to make it. Okay, so usually the tachycardia will settle, <coughs> blood pressure is more stable, and we can uh, reduce the pre and the post ductal sets, come closer, 
and uh, FiO2 decreases. So this is a typical uh, uh, in, uh, progression. If not, then we go on to the high frequency oscillation. We set the frequency 12 to 15, try to get to a higher frequency. And uh, mean area pressure about slightly higher than we, we normally because we are moving from the conventional to the so we, there is a mean area pressure there so we try to go slightly one to two centimeters higher right and uh, with an amplitude sorry, uh, use an amplitude of about not uh, around about 35 30 to 35 right so we try not to you know bash up the lung too much and then again adjust the FiO2 we can do a fairly frequent chest x-rays to see, make sure that the diaphragm of the right lung is about 8 to 9 position, so that is probably about the adequate uh, FRC. And uh, we also avoid the sustained lung inflation that we do for our ARDS <coughs> patients. We do a sustained inflation for ARDS patients, but not in this uh, uh, scenario of uh, hypoplastic lungs. So that uh, recruitment has been done gently over several hours. Now, Nitric oxide has been really very useful for us, although in the, some studies it has not made much uh, difference in the uh, uh, mortality, but I think those uh, scenarios are when people have got ECMO to fall back on. We don't have ECMO to fall back on, so in those days when we didn't have NO, we didn't have ECMO, no, that's the end. You know, the end is when we start using sodium bicarbonate solution to alkalinize. So we don't have that. We don't have to do that now. We have nitric oxide. So now to, for nitric oxide to work, you have to have enough lung volume. You know, you need to have adequate uh, uh, lung uh, uh, recruitment. And uh, so uh, before we go on to nitric oxide, we'd like to measure to see what the pulmonary artery pressure is. And we use the tricuspid regurgitation jet. And uh, if it's more than two-thirds uh, systemic, then we know that uh, we definitely have, of course, if there is a right direction, then we don't really need uh, this TR jet, but it's good to know. Uh, usually the PDA is quite large, so like I said, it looks like it, uh, it's bigger than the aortic arch, uh, the PDA. And there may also be other congenital heart defects, so it's good to exclude these problems. So this is what you could see in the pulmonary hypertension. The right ventricle is dominant, it's big, the left ventricle is squashed. <coughs> And uh, this is, uh, the, uh, illustrates the interventricular dependence. This is a normal scenario. The left ventricle is high pressure. It is circular and the interventricular septum uh, is uh, uh, convex, uh, uh, bulges into the right ventricle. Right? But in the pulmonary hypertension, uh, the, the pressure on the right side is high, so the interventricular septum squashes the, the left ventricle. So when you do a volume loading, uh, you can imagine that uh, instead of uh, getting a better pressure, systolic pressure, you're actually making the situation worse. So we do the volume loading very badly. So we start at 20 parts per minute, uh, per million for nitric oxide, and then we see the, what happens to the post ductal sets. And then if you need to, the measure the TR jet again. And usually the patients start to get better. The hemodynamics improve. If the patient passes urine, the edema then subsides. So uh, positive. Uh, so when we then we then reduce the NO. So it's if not effective. When the NO doesn't work, it's not because the, the nitric oxide is not working. It's just that we haven't got enough lungs open for the NO to, to reach uh, to the pulmonary uh, capillaries. So other uh, uh, adjunctive uh, inotropes. And uh, IV fluids, again, caution that. Sedation, normally we use lots of sedation. We don't, I generally don't use muscle relaxant because I find that uh, I need to know whether the baby is breathing and if the baby is breathing, I can, uh, I need to do something either to clear the secretions or to uh, increase the ventilation. And if the baby is not breathing, I also need to know because then I can then total down my ventilation <coughs> pressures. So uh, a bladder catheter to measuring urine output and minimal disturbance for the baby. Right. So the next few days we wait, we wait for lung recruitment to occur, pulmonary vascular, once the recruitment occurs and all works, pulmonary vascular resistance decreases, then we start to 
getting more definitive, moving the child to a surgery, meaning we have to change our IV access because surgeons don't like the umbilical access. So we move to venous and other started nutrition and very important not to allow the edema to collect because the edema will affect the chest wall edema will affect uh, the compliance of the lung post operation. So we wait. So the cardiac and respiratory stabilization and so the x-rays. So usually you find that with the ventilation over 24 hours you can start to recruit the right the normal side, the, the hips, the contralateral lung starts to open up, the heart moves back into the center, there's a little bit of maybe even the left lung opening up, so there's enough. That's enough for a child to get the surgery. Right, so we need, but our anesthetists impose a lot of uh, requirements, expectations on us. They do not want any inotropes, so we have to take the child off the inotropes. They do not want the child to be on HFOV, going to theater, so we have to get the babies off the high frequency oscillator, no inotropes, they want the FIO to be 40%. These are, <laughs> these are the other ways they will not do the surgery, okay? You forget about it. Okay, so these are the things that we, most of the time we can achieve. I mean, it's good that they push us to do that, all right? Otherwise, we get very comfortable with the chest wall and all that. So chest wall edema has to be reduced and uh, make sure that there is no sepsis on board and then we go for surgical repair. So post-op usually uh, changes, there will be some changes depending on how big the, the, the hernia is. Usually if it's very big, the surgeon will put in a patch, but a patch has got more problems later on. But a patch allows this not so severe distortion of the chest wall. And uh, ventilation requirements will increase a little bit because now you're dealing with chest wall distortion. Okay? So when to, usually they not a severe problem. In pre-op, they are going in state or post-op. This so I'm glad sometimes our anesthetist pushes to get to there. Where there is a buffer for the babies post op, there's a little bit of an increase in decrease in chest wall compliance, but we have built up enough buffer for the baby. So um, so then we just feed to non-invasive very quickly. Usually in a matter of a week, one week or so we are off the ventilator. So now if their baby has to grapple with other problems like chronic lung disease, hopefully we hadn't used too much oxygen, hadn't used uh, too much pressures, and uh, so hopefully the, the chronic lung disease is not a big feature. And I think that over the years we have been a lot more careful, so that's uh, less of a problem, but they still have to grapple with the esophageal reflux, the tracheal bronchial So the, over the years, uh, this is a <coughs> study by one of our master students, a retrospective study of uh, diaphragmatic hernia cases from 2003 to 2012 and over the years <coughs> people are more aware of the work that we do, they send babies to us. So we are seeing more and more antenatal diagnosis, so we are seeing more and more severe cases. Right, so that's the demographics of our uh, patients uh, during the first 10 years. Most of them are outbounds. I would say that outbounds generally do better because if they survive that journey, usually they have fairly good lungs. And uh, mode of delivery, most of them, vertex delivery, uh, about 40% uh, emergency cesarean uh, sections. Usually term, birth, fairly good birth rates and fairly good outcast scores. So we go through the, the, the this is our kind of like uh, SOP for diaphragmatic hernia now. And uh, we have, uh, in this uh, period of 10 years, we have 59 patients, and all of them went through this process of stabilization pre-operation. So let's see, when we say stabilization, it means that uh, this is stabilization before surgery, they are on minimal ventilation, FiO2 is less than 40%, PIP less than 20, rate of less than 60, and uh, definitely the the uh, anesthetist is not going to allow anybody, any baby on each I own into OT. So they are stable uh, on the, with no anotropes or single anotropes and they are, has to be stable for 24 hours. So they achieve stabilization and we have about 72% of our patients who get to surgery and if they get to surgery, the, um, the median day is about, it's about 5.5 days, up to 14 days and those who get to surgery, they survive to discharge. So the unstable ones, they usually uh, they die, uh, and the causes of death, the 
levels of hypoplasia, lung hypoplasia, pulmonary hypertension. We have one case of sepsis. And they die very early, about 20, 20 hours. So if they get past the first 24 hours, generally it's quite good. So now, with just conventional ventilation, we salvaged about 40%, 44% of our patients, about 44% of the number of patients, about half of our survivors can be salvaged with just conventional ventilation. And if we fail that, we go on to the high frequency, positive pressure ventilation with a rate of 100, and we salvage another 14% of the patients, and uh, they go on to the rescue mode, high frequency oscillation, where we salvage another 14%. So the total uh, survival is about 73%. So the types of defects that we have seen over the years, mainly uh, left-sided, of the left, as opposed to the uh, Mugabe, and like I said, you know, if they survive, post op usually it's just uh, quite good. So in summary, it's a, fa a fairly rare disease, complex severity, there's a wide range of variation, and we have recently joined the International uh, Congenital Diaphragmatic Hernia Study Group. Um, it was started by this pediatric surgeon, Chow, and uh, uh, so the last three years we have joined this. Since we have joined, that we, we, we need to collect every case, syndromic or non syndromic. So definitely the, the mortality is you know, uh, much higher because we include the syndromic babies. Otherwise, the syndromic babies never get to the PCICU. Uh, there are no benefits in the recent years. People have started uh, tried to use to see whether surfactant works. It doesn't really. Uh, three needle steroids, no the difference, makes no difference in the survival and uh, the mode of delivery, people think that you know, we'll do a cesarean section, maybe you we know, get a better outcome, it doesn't really make a difference. So what really makes a difference is the pre-op stabilization and the delayed uh, surgical repair, lung recruitment with gentle ventilation strategies, manage the pulmonary hypertension till they are stable and once they're stable, you know, this is the point where we move forward. Alright, so thank you very much.